John, you've made the case for why you believe the election may have been stolen. So now the question is, was there a legal remedy? That's what we shall discuss now. The biggest question is who counts the electoral votes? I want to start by reading the relevant part of the 12th Amendment. It's just two sentences. It follows exactly the words in Article 2 of the Constitution. And the words read, the President of the Senate shall, in the presence of the Senate and House of Representatives, open all certificates, and the votes shall then be counted. So John, make sense of that for us. Well, one thing's very clear, and you, you rightly point out that that language in the 12th Amendment is identical to the original language in Article II. And so we have to look at the, uh, the convention debates and the ratification debates over the original Constitution. One thing's very clear from those debates. They didn't want Congress having a role in the choosing of the president because that would destroy separation of powers. It would make the president subservient to Congress or the legislative branch. And also very clear from that text, it's unambiguously the vice president is the one who opens the certificates. What's ambiguous is who then counts them because as you rightly point out, we shift from the active voice, the vice president opens all the certificates and then they shall be counted. That's in the passive voice. But, but as legal scholars John Yu and Robert Delahunte and Gary Lawson and Jack Bierman have all pointed out, the only person that has an active role in the whole process is the vice president, the president of the Senate. Uh, Congress is there to be present in the presence of the House and Senate. Is that the, right? The vice president counted. And we, we know that uh, from, you know, because of course the first election, there was not going to be a sitting vice president who was already the president of the Senate. So when the convention sent the Constitution to the states for ratification, it included a cover letter and says on the first one, the first thing you'll do is you'll appoint somebody to serve as the president of the Senate and he'll open and count. That's the only evidence we have from the era of, of what they thought about this. So we're pretty sure that the intent of the founders and the drafters was that the vice president counted. You're an originalist, so I would think that settles it. Well, I would think so too. Uh, of course, uh, the question is, does he have to count all the certificates that show up? And of course, that's even among originalists a dispute, uh, or is he... Uh, does, it, does he have some judgment role, some discretion in determining that I'm not going to open and then count certificates that are obviously fraudulent or that should not have been certified? What is the rationale that constitutional scholars employ to now argue that it's Congress that counts, even though it seems pretty clear that the original intent was for the vice president? Well, I think two things. One, Congress like I said, tries to take power to itself. But second, there's this um, uh, intuition that we couldn't possibly give such power to a single person who might be one of the candidates for the office. Um, this self-interested aspect of the vice president serving as the president of the Senate and may well be a candidate for president or for vice president making a judgment no. in his own cause. And no. so there's an intuition there. And don't you think that they would have been aware of whatever conflict existed? Well, so it's important to realize that this dispute about the Electoral College Act and the language of it comes very late in the day of the federal convention. They were involved all summer long, that hot summer in Philadelphia, with much bigger questions, big states versus small states, the lurking question of slavery, those kind of things. And we, we settle on the Electoral College late in the day, and all the intricacies of it that we've had to deal with for the last 200 years are no part of the discussion. I want to expand a little <clears throat> bit on the concern about a conflict between the president and Congress. So what was it specifically that they were worried about? Well, they didn't, they didn't want to set up a parliamentary system where the president, the chief executive, owed his existence and continuing time in office to the sign-off from the parliament or the Congress. They wanted separation of powers. They thought our freedom would be enhanced if the powers, the main executive and the legislative powers were not in the same hands. So they deliberately denied Congress any role in the choosing of the president. 
even in the case of a contingency election where nobody wins an outright majority of electoral votes and it gets thrown to the House of Representatives to decide, it's not thrown to the House with everybody having one vote. It's thrown to the House with each state having one vote, which un under the circumstances was, was as close to you could get as a federalism solution rather than a national legislature solution now, solving it. Now, is it too simplistic to say, well, Congress would appoint the president if the president vetoed XYZ bill. Is that the kind? Or, or didn't veto or our pay increase or you know whatever kind of pressure they want. Or, or more dangerous, if he knows he owes his office to the Congress and he wants to run for re-election re during the whole course of his four years, he's gonna be trimming his sails to do what Congress wants rather than what he and his independent judgment as chief executive thinks is appropriate. And the Supreme Court has never ruled on this question. It's never ruled on this question. Okay, now let's get back to what I think is the biggest hurdle that you mentioned, and that is the conflict of interest. I think most of us think it's so terribly implausible that one man or woman would make a choice that could in effect elect his party and as you said, um, might even elect himself into office if he were running for president. Now that justifies common sense. Well, I think so. And so let's look at it in the founder's perspective. One of the phrases you read in that statutory or that constitutional text was in the presence of the Senate and the House of Representatives. They fully thought that the fact that whatever was going to be done here by the vice president had to be done in public, in the presence of the House and Senate, would be a sufficient check against anything untoward being done by the vice president. The second thing that people forget is if the vice president is, in fact, an interested party, and by that I mean directly interested. He's one of the candidates, not just of, of the same political party as the candidate, because that's going to exist every time, right. um, but is the candidate himself. He always has the option of recusing himself. And the next person in line, the president pro tem of the Senate, would step up and take on the role. Uh, and so those two mechanisms were considered sufficient check. If they'd thought about it or talked about it, uh, I believe, for them to have uh, to have, you know, still recognize that the vice president, rather than Congress, would be the, the ultimate decider or judgment here. You know, again, I want to be very clear on this point. Um, today, we find it absurd that the VP, by rejecting electoral votes, could elect his own party and himself. And the founders counted very heavily on the honor of the vice president. And that was very important. Are there other instances in the Constitution that rely so heavily on the honor? <sighs> you know, I, I mean, uh, we don't have any other ex example like this, I think. Uh, this is really a, a unique provision. Now, we're talking about basically the check is honor. How about the courts? Do they provide a check? Well, uh, I think there, there are uh, significant legal scholarship uh, after Bush versus Gore that argued that the Supreme Court had no role in adjudicating that decision. So Reverend, that's your position. That's my position. One logical choice to count votes, I think, is the uh, Chief Justice. And did they consider the Chief Justice? We don't have any indication from the debates in the convention that they consider the Chief Justice. And again, so just kind of put, the Constitution Convention begins in, in May, May 25th, uh, and ends on September 17th. This discussion about the Electoral College and the language of the Electoral College doesn't occur till the first week of September, very late in the day. And a lot of the bigger questions have now been solved, and they're just kind of filling in the pieces rather quickly. And if anybody had seen the problem of the vice president uh, having an oftentimes self-interested role to play here, uh, nobody talked about it. If they had seen that, maybe they would have made the chief justice preside over the joint session. Now, the other option, I think, which some people have argued, is the states. Let the states decide, and Congress or the VP, whoever does the counting, uh, selects, approves the slate that's been submitted 
by the state unless there are two slates. I think everybody agrees that if there are two slates, right. the question is if there's only one slate, but it's obviously fraudulent, does that power of discernment, of judgment, also exist? And in my view, it does and it must. So, so give an example. <clears throat> so in the last election, we had two states that Trump won pretty clearly, North Carolina and Kansas, but they were both uh, headed by Democrat governors. Let's suppose, despite the popular vote clearly going for Trump, that the governor of, that, of Kansas had certified the Biden electors and sent them. And there's only one slate of electors up there. Is it really the case that the Vice President of the United States, in exercising powers that we've just now conceded, has no ability to make a judgment that these are fraudulent and I'm not going to ratify a fraudulent certification. There is a counter argument, I think. All these states have some process to resolve disputes, so most of the time they'll settle things. Now, there could be fraud, there could be a mistake, but those are vulnerabilities that we have to live with because, look, every arrangement has vulnerabilities, and so the argument is that having the states decide has the fewest number of vulnerabilities. So, so let me change my Kansas hypothetical just a bit. Let's say that Trump won, but it was a close election, and he won on the basis of 20,000 votes that the governor, in collusion with the Secretary of State, is to able to keep hidden away. And we don't discover those extra 20,000 votes that put Trump over the top until the eve of the joint session of Congress. But those votes are discovered, and then it's patently clear to everybody that Trump won, and the governor was involved in a fraud, the and the state on, on that and wasn't able to resolve it in the, in the quick turnaround time. Is it really the case that the vice president has to ratify that acknowledged, admitted, open to everybody fraud? And I think no. And then the question for us is, was there anything like that at issue here? And I believe there was. Eighty years later, we passed the Electoral Count Act, which said explicitly, Congress counts. Congress counts, Congress can object, Congress can reject electors, all of those things, in my view, are usurpations of power that was not given to Congress by the Constitution. And by the way, Congress's recent attempt to amend right. the Electoral Count Act does, I think, two important things. First of all, it assumes that the prior version had enough ambiguity that arguments like mine had some plausibility. And then the second, they make the unconstitutional problem worse because they uh, take even more powers among themselves, which I think is an original matter the Constitution clearly barred. But basically, your argument would hold even under the amended Electoral Count Act. Yes, indeed. Right? But of course, you read a lot of law review articles, and uh, most of those, not all of them, but some of the modern day ones, um, argue that it's Congress that counts, but they all, all of them leave open the possibility that the VP counts. Right. In fact, w w one of the leading articles, remember, nobody looked at this stuff for a century until after Bush versus Gore, and then there's a whole uh, uh, flurry of scholarship. But one of the, one of the leading articles, uh, one of the first articles out of the box, admits that for the first 50 years, everybody agreed that, you know, that the decisions here are vested in the vice president and in the state legislatures. So what we've talked about is the text, a little ambiguous, the intent, which you think is pretty clear. Uh, I don't think there's much in the way of legal precedent. So then we go to historical precedent. How does that weigh? In the election of 1796, there was a dispute about the legality of the electors from New Hampshire John Adams counted, he was the vice president at the time, he counted those electors and put him over the top to win the presidency. In 1800, uh, there was not only a dispute, but pretty clear facial invalidity of the electors from Georgia. They didn't individually sign as the, as the law required. Jefferson counted those on his own, made that unilateral determination. He didn't put it up to a vote of Congress to decide whether we should count these or not. There are scholars on the other side that read the elections of 1796 and 1800 a little differently as evidence 
that Congress counts, not the vice president. I, I will give a brief, okay. a brief view of it because uh, uh, the, the claim is that, well, Adams kind of paused to let Congress raise an objection if they want, nobody objected, so then he proceeded. Implicitly uh, acknowledging Congress's authority to override his decision if they wanted to. I think that's reading a lot into the silence uh, in the debate, and they make a similar argument uh, about the election of 1800. Now we've been talking about who counts, but an equally important question, regardless of who you think counts, is what I would call a question of jurisdiction. For example, say Biden wins the popular vote in Pennsylvania, which appoints Biden electors. But then the Biden electors are bribed to vote for Trump, which they do. So in this case, everyone's clear, regardless of who's counting, that those bribe votes don't get counted. That's part of the electoral vote. But that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is the popular vote. And you, unlike most others, think the vice president can reach into the popular vote. So if there are irregularities, as is the case here, he can make a judgment and potentially reject electors based on an illegal popular vote. So let's change it and take out the bribery of the electors and let's change it to bribery elect election officials allowing unregistered voters to vote in violation of state law, and it clearly tipped the balance on the election. Right, but that's where your detractors would say the vice president can't go. So the, 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 the one, my one disagreement with professors John Yu and uh, Robert Delahunty on this, he says, well, if the legislature in the state hasn't done anything about it, the vice president has no authority to do anything about right. it. Let's, let's change the facts a little bit. Uh, or let's, let's not change it. In Pennsylvania, there was no legislature who could do anything about it because at the end of November, the outgoing legislature ends and the new legislature isn't sworn in until January. So even if they wanted to do something about it, there's no legislative body to meet and do something about it. Are the vice president's hands tied to let this obvious fraud go through and put a guy into the White House who quite clearly didn't win the election uh, as a result, and my answer is no. Other people have said, eh, there's nothing we can do about it. I, I don't think the Constitution is that lacking in the ability to deal with a, a blatant fraud. It's got to be blatant, though. I, you know, I would not let this be used as a pretext. Oh, well, you know, they let some people's signatures go through without, and I'm going to decide that, uh, right. you know, whatever. I mean, it has to be blatant and illegal. And remember, let's go back to one, the other legal issue here we haven't talked about yet, but kind of sets the stage for this. Article two of the Constitution assigns to the state legislatures right. the authority to direct the manner of choosing electors. When state election officials violated those election laws, they were acting not just illegally under state election law, but unconstitutionally in the conduct of a federal election. Uh, and that meant the election was void initially as a result. And, and uh, I, I, you know, in order to uphold the Constitution, I don't think everybody should just sit on their hands and say, oh, we can't do anything about it. Now, as we've said, you did not advise the vice president to reject. You advised him to give the state legislatures a few more days to evaluate what happened. So, so we have an example of a delay, although it was uh, implemented by Congress rather than the vice president. In 1876, there were dual slates of electors from several states that called the election into question. They created a commission. There's no authority specified in the 12th Amendment for the creation of a commission, but they delayed for several months while the commission did an investigation and assessed which of the two slates should be given count. So we have an example of this in our history, even though in that instance, I think it was Congress usurping power right. that belonged to the vice president. But if Congress could do it without any claim of power, certainly the vice president, who has, as an original matter, the judgment authority to decide which ballots to open, I think was important. So to press the delay question, in the Electoral Count Act, I believe, it says something to the effect, you have to decide on election day, there are a few exceptions, 
states which, require, which may have runoffs, I think natural disasters. But except for those, the argument there is make a choice on election day, you don't get to delay. Well, so, so there are two provisions. One's the choice on election day. The second is what happens on January 6th during the joint session of Congress. Right. So let's take the first one. Uh, it's uh, currently codified in Title III, Section 2 of the United States Code. And it basically says, that, you know, you've got you've to meet on the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, what we call Election Day. Uh, uh, and the exception is if they fail to make a uh, decision on that day, the legislature gets to decide. I see. Now, th during debate, and by the way, this, this is not part of the Electoral Count Act of 1887. This is adopted in 1845 after a pretty fraudulent election in 1840. And so people would vote in one state, and then they'd roll over to another state uh, and cast votes there, uh, and it was, it was pretty nefarious. And so Congress put a stop to it by saying we're going to have a uniform election day. Um, uh, the example given by the member of Congress that introduced this language was his own state of Georgia required a majority vote in order to win the election. And so if you had somebody just win a plurality, like the Georgia Senate runoff in 2020, you have to go to a second runoff election. Right. Uh, and so that was certainly one of the motivating reasons why they have this language. But other people in that debate said, well, you know, we might be barred from making it to the polls because a river floods or a bridge goes out. Um, that shouldn't prevent us from being able to have our electoral vote. And in my view, an illegal election is a third category that the language of that provision covers. And it's written down. It's written down. And what are the words? Well, the words are, uh, if, if they fail to make a choice on the day of the election, the legislature can decide what to do right. about it. I'm paraphrasing a little bit. Major provisions of the election law adopted by the legislature were ignored, and that meant you had an invalid election, which meant we may, failed to make a choice by lawful conduct of the election. And has this ever happened before? No, no. Um, well, it may have happened before, but nobody, <laughs> nobody's pushed back on it. <laughs> So, can you delay the joint session? Well, so, there's another provision of the Electoral Count Act that since once they start their work, they cannot adjourn until the work is finished. And that's so, it. now we're on January 6th. January 6th. And once they gavel, the session started at 1 p.m., they got to work through until they finish. Uh, and therefore, a delay would violate the Electoral Count Act. Now, I think even that provision of the Electoral Count Act uh, is not quite so clear-cut as that. It distinguishes between adjourning, and it says you clearly can't adjourn, and a recess, and it says you can't take a recess, and then it says unless it's necessary to resolve a dispute <laughs> over electoral votes, which is exactly what we had. So even the, the statute itself, yeah, even if the statute were clear, and it infringes on the vice president's ability to conduct the investigation he believes is necessary to exercise powers he has directly from the Constitution, then the statute is unconstitutional and can interfere with his, his authority. Um, and so let's assume Congress has the ability to count the votes and make the judgment on whether they're valid or not. And in 1876, they decide that they need two months of a commission to kind of advise them. But there's an Electoral Count Act in place that say once they convene, they can't adjourn or recess. That statute is an unconstitutional infringement on their power to take the necessary break in order to resolve the question. Now, we talked about in the prior section here, uh, you had lots of legislators um, requesting of the vice president that he delay counting. If there were no such requests, could the vice president delay or even reject well, if the case is as blatant as my Kansas case is, then I think he has that judgment power. Now, there, were li there would likely be objectors. Objectors. Your, but even if there weren't. Even if there weren't, uh, I'm sure there would be court actions brought. Uh, but if this thing is really non-justiciable political questions, those should be dismissed on jurisdictional grounds. Um, but, but again, uh, that was not the advice I gave because these were disputed questions. There was investigation. There were investigations that were ongoing. Uh, 
and the legislatures were asking not to reverse the election, not to recertify for Trump, but for a time to make an assessment of whether the illegality they had confirmed had impacted the election to such a degree that the wrong guy but had been Now, certified. my impression is that Trump, at least initially, wanted Pence not to delay, but reject outright. Is he, that had, right? he had some tweets in the days leading up to our meeting on January 4th saying that Trump, I mean, that Pence just has the authority to reject. And some of the legal scholarship and some of the other people that were writing memos and, you know, putting out public statements or whatever had made that case. Um, the president asked me in that meeting in the Oval Office. This is July 4th? January 4th. I mean, January 4th, yeah. yeah. And he had asked me, you know, you agree with that, right? I said, well, it's, it's a lot more complicated and nuanced than that. And it's at that point when the vice president turned to me point blank and said, do you believe I have the authority just simply to reject the votes? And I said, Mr. Vice President, it's an open question. It's never been addressed. There's scholarship on both sides of the issues. I happen to think in these circumstances, it's the weaker argument and that in these circumstances is an important caveat. You made the prudential decision that in these circumstances, it made no sense. We had had revolt in the street, but we also only had one slate of electors that had been certified. And I, and I told him, I said, it would be foolish to exercise such power even if you had it in the absence of the legislature weighing in with a formal certification of alternative electors rather than just the letter. What goes into the vice president's decision. I mean, presumably he needs some evidence. I mean, he can't just wake up in the morning and decide we're gonna reject the other party's votes. So I, I think two things. One, legally, he needs evidence that the wrong electors were certified. Evidence from the legislators. From the legislature. Well, yeah, you, uh, but second, prudentially, the evidence has to be so convincing that if he takes such a dramatic step, that both sides would say, well, that's the right outcome, or at least all but the most crazy people on the fringe. Now, this is, this is in the case of reject. Yeah. Okay, so you're not going to get clear cut yeah. in this case. One has to assume some level of honesty <laughs> on the parties that we're dealing with uh, for clear cut, but yeah, I see the point. So in the case of rejecting, as you just said, it has to be compelling. Both sides have to agree. But now what applies in the case of delay? Because clearly both sides didn't agree in this yeah. case. Well, remember, remember what, what we're dealing with, the difference between a delay and a rejection is that the vice president is making the ultimate decision and settling the matter versus the delay. Okay. And it's not just a delay, but it's a delay and a remand. It's a delay to let the legislatures take up the question that they've asked, been asking you to take up uh, and we're now coming back into session where they could take it up. So what we're doing there is, is sending this back to the legislature to assess what happened in their state and advise the joint session of Congress, including the vice president, who actually won the election to the extent that that can be determined. And my, my memo specifically says, if you send this back to the legislatures and they determine that the impact of the illegality that they all recognized was less than the margin. They let you know that Biden's certification stands and Biden wins. And I've got that in my memo in bold letters. Mm -hmm. um, but if on the other hand, their assessment is that in fact, the wrong guy was certified, that Trump actually won under the principle of our Declaration of Independence about consent of the governed or the will of the voters as we more modernly describe that, how is that gonna be best manifest? If Trump won Pennsylvania, and Biden had been illegally certified, don't we want the actual winner to be properly certified and seated and in order to be the expression of the actual rather than the fraudulent will of the voters? Was there ever a chance that Biden or that Trump would have been declared the winner after January 6th? Well, uh, no, I, I I, I think most people think that the certification on January 6th ends the matter. Um, you know, we got January 6th, we have January 20th. So let's suppose, let's suppose a massive fraud comes to light after the certification. Um, after January after 6th. After January 6th, but before inauguration. Um, and it's quite clear that because of this massive fraud, the wrong guy was certified. 
could Congress reconvene the joint session and revisit the question with all of the fight about whether it's Congress or the Vice President that we've been talking about? I think probably yes. We've never had that happen before. Um, uh, but we're, we're taking as the predicate for that question, the fraud is so manifestly clear that the wrong person was certified. Uh, then there's another interesting question about what happens if that fraud becomes manifestly clear after Inauguration Day? Hands tied, we live with the, the wrongly elected guy for four years. Well, we've got examples in our history, lots of examples of not presidential elections, but congressional elections or state legislative elections where the fraud becomes clear after not only Election Day, but after... And could that conceivably apply in the case of well, the president? Well, it's, it's unclear. Practically. Here's one thing that's clear. The, the Constitution only explicitly has two routes for removing a president. The original Constitution by impeachment for high crimes and misdemeanors. And let's suppose, in fact, the fraud is proven beyond a doubt, so much so that the New York Times even has to write a story saying we admit we were wrong, right? Uh, and Biden had nothing to do with it. He was an innocent beneficiary of this fraud. You can't get him for high crimes and misdemeanors because he had nothing to do with it. And removing him is just going to elevate Kamala Harris, who also benefited from the fraud. That doesn't seem to be a remedy. The other route in the Constitution is if somebody's incapacitated and can be removed. Maybe he is, maybe he's not, but it's got nothing to do with what happened in the election. Right. So then the question is, are those the exclusive routes? And it's, they're the only ones authored, mentioned in the Constitution, but they don't purport to cover the gamut of things that we might confront. What normally we do in that situation is we fall back on the English common law. And the English common law and the law of frauds is if the fraud is proved, it vitiates right. the actions taken, you unravel the actions taken pursuant to the fraud. Uh, and we've, we've got examples of that in other elections. But it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Because I always set up as a predicate, the fraud has to be so clear that even the New York Times would acknowledge it. And that's just, as you pointed out, extremely unlikely, as they would say. Lawyers tend to argue, well, what is the best opinion, right? Not the second best or the third best. And you're arguing the second best or the third best. Well. There's that, but there's also um, uh, the assessment of what was going on. And if, in fact, the election was stolen because of illegal conduct in the way the elections were held, not just illegal, but unconstitutional, right? Then, we, then the very rule of law is at stake if we don't do something about it. So in that circumstance, should you try and make every plausible legal argument to expose what went on and to make sure that the consent, remember, we live in a Republican form of government that is supposed to be derived from the ultimate sovereign authority of the people, giving its consent to government. How says, many yeah. people have looked at this issue? Serious scholars, jurists? Probably a dozen. And, you know, like you said before, in, you know, eight of those 12 probably on at least one or more of the points agree with me. Um, but, uh, but they also disagree with me on other points. But, but uniformly now, uh, except for that eight or 10, most everybody else says, well, the vice president had no authority. He's just a potted plant, or to use the more polite term, it's just a ministerial duty that he's performing. The Constitution doesn't create a lot of just pure ministerial duties. They don't go to the trouble of giving somebody a power that has no discernment or judgment authority behind the exercise of that power. I assume you would give the very same legal advice today. I would. I would. Uh, I, would I wish we had less chaotic legal efforts in November and December making more crystal clear the things that have become increasingly clear since then uh, about the illegality and the, the fraud that occurred as a result of that illegality. So I listen to all this, and I say that the one thing that should be clear is that almost nothing is clear. Everything seems to be contested, and there are usually arguments on both sides. Now, if I were to summarize what brought us to this point of darkness, I would list the following. First, the text of the two controlling documents are very unclear. From the beginning, people have understood the 12th Amendment to be uh, understood different things. 
one of the controlling documents, the Electoral Count Act, is most likely unconstitutional in parts. No court has ruled directly on the issue. There are only a handful of scholars who have even studied it. The historical evidence is clouded. And in the current environment, which is so hyperpartisan, commentary is just so much influenced by one's political beliefs. So if you put all those things together, I think you can explain why things are as dark and opaque as they are. Well, look, uh, a very prominent professor at Harvard who taught an election law class invited me to do an hour-long podcast with him. When we looked, we delved in to the intricacies of this law. It's very dense, <laughs> as you've pointed out, uh, 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 and there are arguments on both sides, and I thought, um, uh, I, I thought credible arguments on both sides. And in fact, this gentleman you're referring to, his name is uh, Larry Lessig. He is the Harvard professor. And I think his podcast is another way. John appeared with Lessig and another scholar. It is a very sort of high-level debate, dense, as John said. It's something that you're not going to get at the first reading, but it bears rereading. So we have one more thing, and that's an advertisement. Now you can imagine that John is not a wealthy man, that his finances are stretched, he's being sued from here to wherever. So John, maybe you could discuss how people could help you. Well more than a half a million dollars in legal fees have already been racked up. I've got a legal defense fund, it's called give send go dot com we'll put that slash on Eastman or you can just Google John Eastman Legal Defense Fund and it'll come up. The beauty of that site is that people can send money to help with the legal defense but also send prayers which both my wife and I read and they're gratifying. And we also use it as a blog of, of you know major articles that kind of really explore what's really going on here and the significance of it. Articles like from people like uh, Roger Kimball who's done a great deal of work or Molly Hemingway and Margot Cleveland and others. Uh, we post links to those articles as well so people can keep up with what's going on. Now I gather you have a substack as well. I have a substack as well, John Eastman.substack or John .substack. You get a lot of requests for interviews, not necessarily friendly, and you record them. I found that if you record an interview with a hostile reporter, um, they tend to be more honest in how they characterize your statements because they know they can be called on it. But, th but there are a couple times when reporters ignored and, and, and published things that were opposite of what I said, and I've got it on tape, and in some of the interviews, I call them out on it with, with some of the other members of the press. So okay. it'll be kind of fun. The Eastman interviews, it'll be the series that, that'll be up on the Substack at some point. So this may be the Eastman tapes. The Eastman tapes. Uh, the Nixon tapes. No. And it won't have an 18-minute gap. <laughs> So why don't we end this section? We'll go on then to the question of prudence. Okay.